So um, that's the spirit. I also want to welcome uh, our, anyone who's logging in or, or, or accessing this remotely because um, we're, we're simulcasting this to Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz, the other Citrus campuses. And today, unfortunately, there is a terrible network snafu. And so network is working like incredibly slowly. So um, to all of you out there, we apologize. We are going to tape the entire record, basically the entire session, and then it will be available whenever the network is available. So if it's frustrating, just turn out for now, and then we'll, we'll send an email about when it will come back on. I apologize for that. I also want to acknowledge some of the, um, the key people here. I want to, um, let's see, the, the executive committee of the, of the, Centru, the Citrus People and Robots um, Initiative. First of all, um, Camille. Crittenden, who's the deputy director of Citrus. We have um, Stefano Carpin, uh, Peter Abiel, Claire Tomlin, and Anka, Anka Dragon uh, from, from the committee, and also Brandy Nanaki, who uh, helped us coordinate all this and actually designed the poster as of this morning. So, on the train. On the train. Awesome. <laughs> so, this poster is going to be a, a work in progress. You're going to see it evolve. We're still um, basically talking to faculty. But this is a, this is a, it's gonna, it's, it's evolutionary process. One key thing I want to um, point out is that the timing, because of um, scheduling um, complications, we're gonna go four to five for the next four weeks or five weeks, and then we're gonna switch over to three to four p.m. And so hopefully that works for you. But again, we'll be sending email, and all these talks will be um, online to so be able to access them to uh, if you if you can't make it in person. Okay. So any questions? about this general thing, where we're going? All right, and I do think the speakers are comfortable taking questions during the time yeah. they have, more or less? Okay, great. So uh, again, it's informal. This is really, think of it as a brainstorming session. We're here to talk about ideas and, and, and look for, for, for things that are happening. So if you have a question, a clarification, or if you want to point something out, please do. And again, maybe that you hear something that's related to someone else in your lab or someone else you know. And, um, and make, we can close that loop and make those connections. That's what we're here to do. So our first speaker is, um, is Claire Tomlin, who is, uh, we all know Claire, so she needs no introduction. Um, but uh, she's, she's fantastic. She's a huge, uh, one of our, our, our treasures here on campus. Claire. Thank you, Ken. OK, I, that, I don't need two. Oh, yeah, I'll hold that. Yeah, so this is, um, I, I, I'm really glad we're doing this, this seminar. Um, because um, for this project where we're trying to think about control and learning together is something that actually I started, and I distinctly remember when Peter was interviewing for his faculty position here, we started talking about this. And you know, soon after you started, we started talking about this more. And then Jeremy Gilula, um, you know, interacted with um, one of Peter's students. And so it was really an effort that, um, you know, I learned a lot from Peter and his group, and um, and it I, it's something that I'm really enjoying working on. So I'm going to talk about that part of it today. Um, but it's also with a number of other students. Um, the first three are PhD students here. Um, Jaime is a student working with Shankar, and Jeremy graduated a couple of years ago now. Okay, so um, this is. Um, uh, system that I've been working on um, even back when I was a grad student, the air traffic control system. It's a system that is a human-centered control system, um, very manually controlled. So human air traffic controllers sit in centers on the ground. They look at traffic over radar feeds, and they talk to pilots, and they tell them exactly where to go. They tell them each action they have to take, whether or not they follow a route or take a deviation from a route. And it's a very challenging control problem. There's lots of aircraft in the system. Each controller is responsible for about 15 aircraft at any given time. And he or she just basically cycles through all the aircraft. And the, the, the most important thing is to make sure that the aircraft don't come within a certain distance of each other. So it's a safety critical control system. And um, as a result, it's um, something that is typically controlled in a, um, in a way that's, well, it's not optimal. Um, the, there's a big safety margin, typically more than, than is needed when the system evolves. Um, so if we look at an individual aircraft under air traffic control, you can view it as this, um, this kind of hybrid system 
where these individual um, circles in this finite state machine model look like um, you know, an individual control mode. Typically, the controller is keeping the aircraft at a speed which is optimal for its altitude. And then in order to resolve conflicts, they'll slow it down or speed it up if they can do that to within plus or minus 10%. They'll take detours or shortcuts. Um, they'll do altitude changes if they have to. Um, and then the last resort is to put it on a hold. So typically when you look at this system, um, to simplify the problem of controlling a large number of aircraft, there's a lot of root structure in the air and there's a small set of control actions that um, controllers will take. Um, they also, if you spend a lot of time sitting behind air traffic controllers, which I've done, they tend to group aircraft together by potential conflict. So here's an easy situation if they're both flying at the same velocity. And you can group these aircraft together, basically treat it like one aircraft. But the harder ones are when you have potential conflict. So the controllers would be spending more time on a situation like this and then up and coming a situation like that. So cycling between thinking about who they're going to deviate, et cetera, et cetera. So in terms of projects that we've been working on, for years we've been working with NASA and the FAA to think about what functionality you could automate. And so again, it's a safety critical system. If you automate it, you have to be able to verify that nothing's going to go wrong. And that's, that's the challenge. So in the past year, we've been working on something new. Uh, we continue our work with air traffic control, but as you've probably heard, what a number of um, large businesses want to do is to put UAVs into the national airspace system. And the FAA doesn't really know how to deal with this. So they're going to NASA, their research branch, and saying, let's figure out how we can make this airspace system more flexible so businesses like Amazon and Google, Google can fly their UAVs um, in um, a way that doesn't involve you know, two weeks ahead time of um, reserving the airspace, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's a little bit of a clean slate. Um, NASA is working on a tool, uh, they call it UTM, Unmanned Air System Traffic Management, and they'd basically like to build a traffic management system for networks of UAVs flying through the airspace. Um, first, you know, I don't really expect that we're gonna, the skies are gonna be darkened by UAVs flying above us. But there are, um, there are, you know, a lot of people are flying, U I mean, we fly UAVs, we don't have approval right now. There's a lot of people like us flying around. And, um, and that's, you know, basically the FAA is trying to put a structure on this. So when we think about designing a new UTM system, the concepts of, you know, safety are also paramount. Um, you know, these are UAVs, they're not piloted, but if they fall out of the sky, they're probably going to fall if, over a large urban area where you would expect to see a lot of these, they could fall on somebody. Um, simplicity. Again, um, there is going to be a human in the loop. It's a much more automated system than air traffic management, but where that human is, um, you know, depends on the, the overall design and structure of the system. But still, there will be a person in the system, and they're going to have to intervene if there's a problem. So it has to be simple. It has to be understandable by people. And what maybe what's a little bit different is it is going to be an automated system. So these systems have to be able to um, take, take in data and learn from what's going on and adapt to new situations. Okay, so we're working on a couple of different projects on this. Again, now, unlike the FAA, the sort of previous work we've been doing, which we continue, these are kind of short-term things, year-long projects. Here, you have to do this in a year. It's very fast-moving, which is it's kind of exciting. Okay, so we've been working for a long time on um, a, a model and a control theory for hybrid systems, which tries to um, uh, capture these ideas of simplicity. So understanding how a system um, evolves or understanding how to control a system by organizing its behavior into modes and then having a continuous dynamic, which is hopefully sort of simpler than the whole system would be in each mode. So, you know, different flight modes, for example, and then there's a continuous dynamic where there's control and disturbance inputs and transitions from mode to mode can be controlled or a disturbance could affect those. And we've been working for a long time on tools for controller synthesis for hybrid systems for which you have an a priori proof of a certain behavior, a certain specification. So we're interested in safety critical systems. So we've been spending a lot of time working on um, controller synthesis for safety. And, and here's the general idea. Suppose you have a system. Here I've just represented it by a differential equation with a control and a disturbance. And suppose you could characterize all things. Let's suppose this is unsafe. 
things that you, um, configurations of the state space, things that you um, characterize a priori as unsafe, then if you could calculate all of the states which could, under your best possible control action, either the dynamics or the disturbance could push your system into that unsafe region, then you want to avoid that set. Okay, so you want to stay in a safe region. And moreover, when you get close to the boundary, you want to make sure that your control authority is um, maybe filtered away, that you apply that control law that's going to keep you safe. And if you can do that and you trust the models, then you've proven for the models that you've used that the system is safe. And out here, you can control according to some performance criterion or a number of criteria. So we've built a well, we've worked on different variants of this problem for a number of years. We use the, uh, the framework of game theory to compute these sets. Um, game theory because typically you want to protect against disturbances that you don't know, I mean, by, by definition, what those disturbances are going to do. And we've, um, because the sets that we're interested, we're looking at systems which are typically nonlinear, the sets are not necessarily convex, we use an... Um, an implicit uh, way of defining the sets and evolving those sets. So we use level set methods. Basically, the idea is to represent the set as the sub-zero level sets of some function and then um, find a way of evolving that function over, in ta over time according to the dynamics of the system. And so we've, we've built a toolbox around this. This is my first PhD student. He's now a professor in CS at uh, UBC in Vancouver. And um, he worked on this for his PhD, and he built a level set toolbox. You can actually um, download it. There's a number of examples you can try. You can download it, change the examples to a dynamic that you're interested in, evolve them, and, and, and work out these problems. So here's an example. Um, these are four quad rotors. This is our, our first quad rotor team. So we built these ourselves. This is before you can just go and buy one for, you know, like 19.99 at Amazon. Um, and uh, there are four students who are controlling these quad rotors. And um, they're being manually controlled except when the quad rotors get to the boundary of this uh, backwards reachable set that we just talked about, then the automation takes over on board the quad rotor and guides the aircraft away from each other. And then it gives it the control, as soon as they get away from the set, it gives control back to the the student in a really unfriendly way. So there's no um, claim on human um, machine interfaces here at all. It's just a test to see if that protocol works. You can also turn this problem around and use it to capture desired effects. So um, yeah, you can do that by just you know, solving a similar control problem. And you can also solve these for hybrid systems. So you can chain modes together and compute you know, how, where you have to be to capture a region that will get you to um, a set that you want to get to while avoiding an unsafe set. Okay, so, so here's a, an example. I had four vehicles, and we computed the reachable sets um, to um, basically have these uh, vehicles, and these are fixed-wing vehicles in the models, fly through a certain region where there are fixed obstacles and also you know, moving obstacles according to the other vehicles. So the vehicles become obstacles for each other. And we did it by prioritizing. So vehicle one gets to go first. Here it starts out. Here's its uh, capture basin for its desired um, end configuration. And then vehicle two has to consider vehicle one as its moving obstacle as well as the fixed obstacle. So you can compute these regions and you can see that you know, pieces of the sets are pulled out as, the, as each vehicle higher in the priority takes, um, takes chunks of that region away. And here's, um, here's a, one of the concepts that we've been working on for NASA in terms of this UTM problem. Um, we, uh, this is just an example. So, so this is... Um, uh, a, a calculation that inspired us to think about platoons. There's um, maybe a warehouse in Concord, and um, you want to get the, U, the UAVs to, typically they're going to the, the larger urban areas. And um, if you put a cost on the space below, so here water is pretty cheap, um, because if it falls into the water, that's typically not such a big deal. The cities are um, more expensive. The wooded areas can be a little bit less expensive. 
Um, airports are very expensive. You don't really want to spend much time in a region around an airport. Um, and then you just do a simple, um, this was just a simple fast marching method to do fast, uh, to do uh, uh, route planning. You see the emergence of these trunk routes and then routes breaking off from that. So you would expect this kind of highway structure to come out of such a problem. And so sort of maintaining the simplicity of a structure in the airspace um, is probably going to be maintained in the UTM system. But it also allows us to think about platooning, you know, inspired by the work that was done here back um, in the 90s in the PATH project for platooning cars. You could think about each vehicle, each one of these uh, UAVs in a platoon, as um, being a hybrid system where its mode, and this is a simplification, but it's a pretty good simplification, its mode depends on um, its control mode relative to the platoon. So if it's not on a highway, it can be a free vehicle. When it enters a highway, it's either a leader of a platoon or it joins a platoon. And then um, typically, they're flying at the same altitude. And if there's a problem, you can descend to a, or we assume that you can descend or ascend to a different altitude. And so how to encode now not only the control, the continuous control, which is typically an easy problem, but the guards on these transitions. Like, can you actually get those guards just by doing a safety calculation using reachable sets? And the answer is yes. Um, we did that. We computed for each vehicle, and this is an example showing two vehicles merging onto a highway, a red vehicle and a blue vehicle. They're both their capture basin, so he wants to get to this position, and also the set they have to avoid, and that's typically, you know, um, around one of the other vehicles. Um, and so the controls are very simple. It comes up with basically a sequence of maneuvers just by solving this reachability calculation, which indicate when you should transition from one of those modes to the other to guarantee safety, as long as you trust the models that you're using. And what's nice is that if you look at that, and let's just do it for a larger platoon with, and we'll remove all that set information um, so you can actually see what's happening, you see this kind of emergence of what you would expect naturally, sort of an even flow into a platoon. And the organization of the platoon ensures that you know, each vehicle only has to compute its safety with respect to the vehicle in front and behind, which allows you to do this calculation in real time. Because typically these um, reachable set calculations are, well, they're essentially it's dynamic programming and they're very expensive. So you want to be able to decompose the problem somehow to deal, or, deal in smaller dimensions. Okay, so finally, um, let's finish up by talking about the problem that I mentioned at the very beginning. So we spent a lot of time thinking about reachability for safety and working on different problems. And um, in many of these applications, in particular as the UAV, you know, this UTM application, as it's flying, it's gathering data. If it has to do a forced landing, it's going to try to do it in a spot that has least cost to the environment around it. So it's, it's gathering, you know, information from its sensors as it's flying. So we want to be able to update um, the control even as we're flying, yet we want to be able to make guarantees still about the safety of the vehicle. So we've been working on a combination of um, safety control, which is basically the control that I just talked about. Yet, if the vehicle is operating inside, off the boundary, inside its safe set for safety that we've calculated, let's just use learning. Let's use online learning to update information about itself, about its environment, um, recompute the control, so that the, we're taking advantage of the information that it's learning in real time. So we, um, we did an, an experiment um, where, so this is with our quad rotors inside our flying room. It's just a single quad rotor experiment where now um, the vehicle has to stay safe so it, it can't crash into the ground or the ceiling. And, but we're asking it to track a step trajectory. So it just has to go up and down in altitude. Um, so what we've done is we've computed the reachable set based on not crashing into the ground or the ceiling. And then we took the vehicle's model away from it and we asked it to learn its model so that it could track this step trajectory. When it comes to the boundary of the envelope, it still knows what control to apply. We're still giving it that information, but we're asking it to learn about itself inside the envelope as a demonstration of this idea. 
Um, so it does what you would expect. It first drops to the ground. It doesn't crash because it hits the envelope, but it doesn't know its own model. And you can see it sort of bumping up and down against the bottom of the envelope. It's learning that if it applies a little bit of thrust, it's going to go up. It knows it wants to, tra to track that blue dashed um, trajectory. And so after about a minute, it does a pretty good job of tracking that trajectory. Um, we're using this um, policy gradient uh, sign derivative um, learning algorithm here. So it's very simple. Okay, so, so we've been now taking this further and asking, um, well, if we can learn um, a better model inside these envelopes, maybe we can learn better envelopes over time. And so we've done a number of experiments there. And one of the directions we've been taking is to... Um, is to only learn, because it's expensive to update the envelope, so only update that part of the envelope that you're really using, the part that you're operating in. And if you can, you know, uh, turn, as you learn more about the model, if you could, and the system, if you could update that value function that represents the reachable set only in local regions where you're operating, that can be very efficient. And so we've done that, um, and uh, the details are sort of, you know, interesting, but I think the main point is that um, we'd like to, you know, think about these different paradigms of combining learning with um, control so that we can still prove safety or still prove the underlying control specification, but we make the control as, as flexible as we can. Okay, so I think um, in the interest of time, I'll um, just conclude. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about analysis and control of hybrid systems, safety from reachability analysis, simplicity from the hybrid system representation. Um, uh, we've done a number of things. You can actually, uh, I won't show the video, we've been trying to build up a number of experimental test beds. You saw our quad rotors. We've also got, um, a, a, we call it an air traffic control light game that you can download. It's called Contrails. And, and try your hand at, um, at landing aircraft over different, safe, uh, over different levels of difficulty. And while you're doing that, we're collecting all of your data to see how you, um, you do this. <laughs> um, and we talked about um, incorporating learning. And I've worked on a, our group has been working on a number of other directions, energy efficiency, buildings to grid, um, a lot of projects in systems biology, including a project with uh, Rujana and Jose Carmena, where we're thinking about um, incorporating brain-machine interfaces into understanding um, motor function. And I think then I'll leave it with this idea about where, I, and this is probably the simplest slide since I just made it up like a few minutes ago. Um, I, I'm really interested in this perception and control loop, and I know many of you are. Um, and I think that you know, you can't really do one well without the other. So we, we've been talking amongst our group, and I think that, you know, this closed loop really requires us to think about models. And models, I mean, we've been talking about models for motion, models for dynamics. Models can be much more general than that. So models of organizations or procedures or how to respond to something, for example, as we're thinking about, you know, how might we automate some of this brain functionality. Okay, and so I'd just like to thank um, current students as well as students who contributed to this project who've now gone on to um, 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 other, other places or um, other universities or other companies. So thanks very much. Thank you, Claire. Okay, so we have time for a few questions. Maybe um, Lucina will uh, set up your computer while we do this. Um, already collaborating with many people um, on campus. I'm actually curious if there's other groups for which this uh, resonates that's so related to anything that they're doing. So, I mean, I can say that, for example, an area that we've talked um, with Kenny, one of your students, about was um, looking at this in the context of surgery, for example, so robotic surgery, where, again, you have this situation where there's certain areas that you want to avoid, right, unsafe regions in surgery, like um, the surface of um, the, the human flesh, obviously, you don't want to gouge that. Um, or it, when we're doing experiments, even the, the tabletop is actually very dangerous because you can damage the robot arms. These arms are actually very delicate. So we're thinking about adapting something very analogous um, or, or some of Claire's ideas. Um, for And it looks like that maps perfectly on. Um, how about other areas that 
that you're working in or other groups? I'm particularly interested in hearing from people who Claire may not have talked to recently, et cetera. Are you saying by your silence that there's no relevant, that it's not relevant to what you're working on? I can't believe that. Should I do not? I'll throw something out. All right, Peter. Thank you. I think uh, for a lot of the learning, Chelsea and Sergey have been working on. Um, initially, the learning requires a person nearby to reset everything and to get the robot back into its initial state so it can try again. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of safety, I think, ties closely into being able to just let the robot learn on its own, and the safety region is wherever the robot can reset from so it can try again. Ah. Right, so the unsafe region is a region where you can't reset, essentially, right? Because Peter's been looking at this scenario where you want to have a learn of a bird. Peter and, and Chelsea and Sergey and a lot of his students are looking at this scenario where the robot's going to be off running for, for like hours all night long or something, right? So you want it to be able to, um, to recover. And so there actually is a fairly large safe area, but then there's this unsafe area that's very analogous. Good. Um, okay. Um, one other thing that I'm, struck me, Claire, about this is that the, as you said, the, the, um, the idea of the reachable set is a very conservative one, right? That it's, it's a set from which you can reach the unsafe. Well, it doesn't have to be. It depends okay. on what your model of the disturbances are. So the, the, more, the more you know about the uncertainty in the system, the less conservative those sets are, okay. which is intuitive. Okay. Yeah. So if, if it's adversarial, then it's worst case. But if it's uh, just random or just... Yeah, then you can incorporate a stochastic model for the disturbance, and you get a stochastic reachable set. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit harder, okay. typically. More harder. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And then um, you mentioned that the level set tools are available online? They are, yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, and her website is linked everywhere, so you can find if you're interested in following up with her. And um, good. So what we'll do is um, I will thank you, Claire. I will encourage everyone to follow up with her. She'll stick around. I think a few minutes after five, um, and we will. Or no, she has to. You have to pick up from school. All right, all right. Never mind. <laughs> never mind. If you need it, if you want to reach her in any way, and you can't but directly. <coughs> All right. Thank you, Claire. All right. Well, now we have another um, amazing treasure here from uh, from on campus, and uh, I've known her for a long time. She was my uh, my research advisor. I got interested in robotics as an undergraduate when I walked into her lab at UPenn um, a few years ago. This is uh, Rujina Baichi. Thank you. What should I do with this low technology? Oh, just, you're good. It's, it's, well, it's okay. Yep. All right, so the first thing I want to say, you know, I have been around, so I have tried this and tried that and dancing and jumping and, you know, so I can tell you what will not work. I'm not sure I can tell you what will work, but what will not work, I tried. Uh, the other thing I want to tell you is that we have a course, and um, <clears throat> to my great pleasure, we have 70 students in this introduction to robotics. So the, the students really are interested. And if you want to know more about the course, the course also has projects. So if you have any ideas for projects, it's a one month project. And we have two Baxters and one UI5. And we have sensors and all that. So we teach students both kinematics, how you move, and also how you jump, dynamics, and we teach also students how to use vision and force sensing and what else. Well, we haven't taught them how to use acoustic sensor yet, but we could in principle. Any case, uh, Victor Shia, who is sitting there, is in charge of the GSI. I have pleasure of having three GSI, Robert, Matthew, and Jaime. Um, and so if you want to know more about that resource of doing some basic work for, for us, for this community, uh, we are open to ideas. Rob, Victor, you want to say anything more about the project?
Right. We, the, this is a project for one month of groups of two, three people, and they know the big chunk of the grade is on projects, so they really have to come up with some, <coughs> some serious results. Okay. So, <coughs> as was advertised, I was at Penn for 30 years, and um, I did, um, I had this colleague, Max Mintz, who I am sure you guys may know him, right? And he always said, Ruzhina, control is trivial if, if you can solve perception. So I took that very much into my heart, and I basically devoted my whole academic career to perception. And as Claire kindly showed this, you can't really do serious perception without control, because you have to control where you are looking and where you are touching, and that's why we invented this word active perception, but it's really basically using perception with control to get the right information at the right time. So that's what we did. So since I came to Berkeley, which is roughly 2001, I started to focus on people. So I'm devoting my life here on measuring people. And it's an extremely rich um, domain because everybody is different. You know, you don't reach the same way, you don't exercise the same way, and in fact, even during your lifetime, your dynamics changing, your muscles strength changing, you, you don't lift as, as heavy objects as you do, as you did when you were young, you don't jump as high as you did when you were young. So, so we are spending in my group quite a bit of um, resources and time on how to measure people, the kinematics and the dynamics. Now the implications are tremendous, especially for healthcare. And uh, that's what I will try to show you. But if we can develop a good model of human kinematics and dynamics, then you can really s model this interaction of robots and human. So my philosophy is that you really cannot make predictive models of human-robot interaction unless to model <coughs> the robot is trivial because you can measure every goddamn piece of the, the, the robot, you know, how it moves, you know, what the linkages are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But human, you can't really drill into your shoulder to measure your axis of rotation and, and so so that's a little bit more challenging. But in order to really model properly this interaction of human-robot, you really, really need a good model of the human. So that's what we are focusing on. Okay, so here is my first slide. Today, humans interact with cyber-physical systems on a daily basis. We wish to understand the dynamics of the interaction and trade-off when an autonomous system versus human should be in control of the momentary situation. <clears throat> the key is that if you have a robot, what should be the role of the robot versus the human? So think about a, a robot that is helping a nurse lifting a human from the bed and carrying them to the bathroom, okay? Where should the robot put their hands as opposed to the human? And, and the, you, you have this deformable object, okay? And so this is non-trivial, and we, we, we haven't solved it yet, but that's where we are heading. <clears throat> okay, so dynamics of interaction between human and autonomous system, let us assume that we can develop dynamical model of human physical activity. Similarly, we can assume that we have a dynamical model of a mechanistic yet multi-degree freedom system. If these two systems are mechanically coupled, 
then the dynamics changes of the overall system. This is really a critical point because you can have a dynamical model of the robot separately and the human. Nevertheless, when they couple, it's a different system. So you really need to measure perception and control, how you are interacting with each other. So that is really the key. <clears throat> Okay, so, um, so we need understanding the task, and how much time do I have, Ken? 15 minutes or so? Okay, so what we have done is, is a kind of a, a um, I, I don't have this very nice story as Claire gave you of, of starting from his PhD thesis, down the line, so <clears throat> I will tell you what we have done over the last, I don't know, seven years or so, roughly speaking. And um, <clears throat> we have done this human interaction in the car. We have done human interaction with a coach of exercising coach. And uh, we are now uh, exploring in, um, with, with some healthcare people, the, the um, stroke patient with respect to physical activity. Because if you have a stroke in your motoric cortex, it's a very interesting problem because it hits only half of your, let's say you, you get demobilized one of your arms, all right? Because only part of your motoric cortex is hit. Now, the interesting thing is, speaking of learning or plasticity, if you wish, is that it turns out that if you start to exercise this, this um, um, demobilized arm, the neurons that have been hit on your motoric cortex get reassigned to the healthy cortex. So the healthy cortex start to share not only your or good, good side, which was not damaged, but also of your damaged side. So by rehabilitation and exercise, you can partially recover the capabilities, the movement capabilities of the of the the arm and so the question is what can really technology in this case help so what we have started was starting doing some action recognition and claire was kind enough to show <clears throat> what she has what kind of tools we have well we have a database and anybody who wants to study physical movement uh, this database is available to you. It's a motion capture database, and um, it's available to you. So I will show you. <coughs> okay, so you can see. This is a motion capture. Uh, we have um, four, 12 subjects of different size and age, and uh, we have, I think, uh, <clears throat> almost 20 different exercises, so you can do some classification. And here is your, <clears throat> here is your skeleton <clears throat> that you get from the, this, this motion capture, and you can do classi automatic classification of the motion, uh, of the motion, and thereby classify the, the action. Okay, so here is a very nice but very simple example how kinematics can be useful for diagnostic purposes. So you, we have there here uh, a, a subject where we can um, capture the, the kinematics of the motion, as you saw before. But then from forward kinematics, we can measure the volume, the reachable volume of people, okay? And it turns out that it's now being used as a diagnostic tool for muscular dystrophy children 
you know, because they have a much less smaller this volume. And so by measuring this volume, you can classify how severe their disease is in a much more quantitative fashion than ever before. So what you have here is you can see here that on the left side is the volume of a normal person, and on the right side is of a sick person person, which sometimes they cannot even touch their hairs or comb their hairs or brush their teeth. So it's a very serious disease. And currently, <clears throat> there is really no known cure. And they are using this diagnostic tool and measurement tool for experimenting with some DNA uh, cure. But who knows what will happen. But it's, to me, the interesting question here is that when you really want to take your <clears throat> basic scientific technology to real application, you have to make it as simple as possible. Otherwise, they will not talk to you. So this is very simple technology. OK, so then I had a <clears throat> graduate student who is now a professor at the University of Michigan, and uh, Ram Vasudevan, and he has discovered, actually, that as Professor Tomlin was telling you about hybrid system, that walking can be modeled by a hybrid system. And so you have here. And the way how you can do the switching is based on your how much contact each fit, foot will have. So you can hear toe lift, heel lift, heel strike, toe strike. And we have done several experiments, and we have shown that everybody, normal person, walks like this. So this is a generic model of walking. And the only difference is, depending on Bai Chi, who is not that young, and of the younger people, that how much time do you spend on each, each um, site. OK, so that's the only difference. But the, uh, the underlying model is generic. So that was a very pleasing result. And here is the, the control system that we have measured. And as you can see, um, where, where the, the, the points are. Now, Victor Shia, for his thesis, has been trying to analyze this, but it's a very complicated system, as a reachable set for stability. Namely, what you really want to do is, so we have reduced the complexity of walking for, for sitting and standing. So you have only two states, states and not four states. And to study, you know, what is how stable you are. So for example, if you are an elderly person, you are not surprised that people bend forward because you are trying to put your gravity closer to the ground. Okay, when you are a young person, you well, the, what they say, you 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 stand tall, right? So, I mean, it's an issue of stability and how to model it and predict for diagnostic purposes, and then what kind of mechanisms to help is really the issue that we are trying to address. So this is an, um, a, a slide which uh, shows Aaron Bestick, who is currently at Surgical Intuitive. And he is studying this, how you hand off the, the uh, whatever intentions you have with respect to the robot, ultimately. His thesis is going to be of how we lift together with a robot an object, and maybe even a, if we are lucky with Anka's help or so, we can look at the deformable objects. I think that would be very interesting. But in order to do that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so we need to, and you can see he has these markers, so we are measuring his kinematics, so his kinematics we can do because we can really put markers on the joints and we can get the actuations and so forth. The real challenge is how to measure the muscle strengths and, and the tendons, how they, are, how they are reacting. 
and um, we are looking at different ways. So the standard way is using EMG, and I have a student who is looking at that. You also can, can sh uh, have an infrared light that can measure the amount of oxygenation of, your, of the muscles when it reflects back. The oxygenation um, tells you how, uh, how much, how, how hard the, the muscle is, has been consuming oxygen and therefore being darker or lighter, and thereby you can measure that. But now we are looking at, and Laura is going to work with the, uh, we, we got an, a very nice ultrasound gadget that we are hoping to use for measuring the in the, the your arm you know a quiet and then if it presses to see how how the muscle changes through the ultrasound but it's all right now in a calibration phase which i am sure many of you don't like to hear calibration is scary and so but you have to do it i mean there is no other way so that's what we are right now in uh, in in uh, in uh, process of developing um so um okay so now we also have done and victor and also ram uh, we we are looking at the driver in in the car, and the question there is, when how do you detect that the driver is not paying attention, and when you really want to s need to switch for an automatic driver, because I actually don't believe. I know somebody asked, raise your hand. I think it was you at the, at the ISRR that how many people believe that there will be an, a no human driver in 2020 or something like that. And I said, no, I don't believe that. So I proclaim to you here, ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe that automated drivers will take over. And the reason is that Grandma Baichi is not going to giving up her little BMW. <laughs> and I'm sure there are many Grandma Baichis out there. So I think What's, what's, what's happening and what will happen more and more, that these cars will have more devices which will alert you that you are closer to, to the, 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 the bad lines or that you have to do something or the other. Uh, but any case, um, um, so I, I really believe that the, the future, at least for next 10 years, is going to be a mixed. And so that's what we have been looking at and Katie, Campbell, who is right now somewhere in Europe, I don't know where, she is studying this human driver. <laughs> My students are all over, you know. And uh, she's studying the, the, the capabilities of the human and how to switch. Again, it's a hybrid system. That's how we look at it, what the human can do and under which circumstances to put, it, put the automated driving. So that's what she does. And of course, here we have our, our driver, you know, measuring the kinematics. And now, if we should be so lucky with Lo Laura and everybody else doing this muscle, um, then we are, the next thing we are going to look at the legs. Because to me, I know it from myself that the reaction time is not as fast as it is, I'm sure, with you. So, you know, I'm very self-conscious on, on that. And it seems to me that measuring the dynamics of the driver will turn out to be important. OK, so here we have the, the big challenge. You see, this is your, this is your uh, reachability set. And you want to narrow it as best as you can, depending on the, the measurements of the road. And so the big thing is what if you have another car or uh, cars, you know, surrounding you, how do you change lanes? And so that's what I want. So finally, um, I, I am very lucky to collaborate with 
Tomlin Shastri. The driving was with Borelli. We, we don't do that anymore, but here was the, the research staff. And um, the medical is Dr. Hahn from Davis. We are now starting some new collaborations with some other people at uh, San Francisco and uh, UPenn. So, you know, life goes on. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Rujna. Okay, so we have more time for a couple quick questions. Again, anything that links with work that you're working on? Who's working on humans? We both just came back from the ISRR, I want to tell you very quickly. And the interesting thing is that the whole international community is into humans and robots. That's the, the headline, okay? Yeah. Now, the second thing is interestingly <laughs> I want to share with you is that um, people are talking very seriously about modularity, that you can think about modules. And Professor Ron Fearing has been at this for some time, but you know, the, the big question is how do you go from these paper robots that he has been building to scale up to, to bigger robots? And what else can you, you were there, so to my great surprise, you know, we started at Penn in 1974, the, the first tactile finger. Peter Allen was the first p student who was uh, using finger for assessing whether it's a hard surface or it's an air and so forth. Anyway, then Ken, together with another mechanical engineer, they built a three finger at hand and, and put tactile sensors on the fingers, and we have a joint paper on that from 79, I believe, and so. Guess what? Tactile sync was, touch was put aside, was, was, was put to sleep. Now, at this meeting, a big session on tactile and fingers. So, let me tell you guys, Next semester, Shankar Shastri and Rujna Baichi are going to teach a continuation of this course together with Jaime on grasping. We are buying a, f a hand with three fingers and tactile sensors. Okay, so we are going to teach you how to formulate grasping and also mobility, the holonomy and non-holonomy. Sorry, sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> Oh, wow. I was just going to point out a intersection point between Rujna's work with Aaron and Jaime's work uh, with Tom and, and Claire on adaptive robots and ro robots that can predict what you want and adapt to you. Because when you carry something with a person, you have to figure out whether the, wh what the person, where they're going and what they're trying to avoid and what not. And you have to react to that or maybe the, have to get the person to react to the robot. And so these are some of the things that these guys are looking at. Looks like Aaron is looking at that. And maybe Ken with Allison Okamura, because Allison at Stanford also told me about this problem. And I think maybe in collaboration with Ken and Peter, they're looking at it too. So I feel like we should have a big joint party on robots adapting to humans and vice versa. You know, guys, I may be old-fashioned. I still believe in kinematics and dynamics. And I'm like, you know, my friend here. <laughs> <laughs> Who refuses that kinematics exists? Learning and all that. But I tell you, in 1985, we did reinforcement learning with Salganik, remember? Okay. Anyway, so I am not against against learning, but I do believe <laughs> that, in my heart that there is a Newtonian world out there, and I believe that it would be stupid not to use it as a structure. So that's good. But I am not against learning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fantastic. All right. On that note, thank you. Thank you.